Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Jenny Shirley Lee. I'm an assistant professor and an laboratory director at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on ACTH and cortisol. Hormones released by the hypothalamus regulate the anterior pituitary hormones. CRH is synthesized and released from the hypothalamus. It stimulates the synthesis and the release of ACTH from the pituitary gland. ACTH is secreted in response to several factors, of which CRH is the most important. The adrenal cortex secretes cortisone in response to ACTH. When plasma cortisone increases, it suppresses the release of CRH and ACTH, which in turn leads to lowering the cortisol level. Conversely, when serum cortisol reaches a decreased level, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland respond by increasing CRH and ACTH production, leading to stimulation of cortisol formation and secretion. By this mechanism, ACTH and cortisol control the concentration of each other within a very narrow range. Cushion syndrome is composed of a group of clinical and metabolic disorders resulting from prolonged exposure to elevated concentrations of glucocorticoids. The excessive levels of glucocorticoids may be of endogenous origin, which is secreted by the adrenal zona vasculata, or of exogenous origin, for example, pharmacologically administered steroids. Patients with severe forms of the syndrome are easily recognized by the symptoms like stride rubro, facial plas plasro, proximal muscle weakness, visceral fat accumulation, easy browsing and hypokalemia. Many of the signs and symptoms like obesity, diabetes, due to hypercortisolism are common medical complaints. However, it is important to suspect cushions in certain situations as these have an increase in mobility and mortality. Cushing syndrome is categorized as ACTH dependent or ACTH independent. ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome represents increased ACTH, which in turn increases the cortisone production. This includes ACTH producing pituitary adenoma or Cushing disease and ectopic ACTH syndrome, where ACTH is produced by other organs. In contrast, ACTH independent Cushing syndrome happens when endogenous and exogenous high level of cortisone suppresses ACTH secretion and makes ACTH level low. This includes adrenal cortical adenoma or carcinoma, which produces very high level of cortisone. The tests for the differential diagnosis will be discussed in next slides. The most important first step in the management of patients with suspected Cushing syndrome is to establish the correct diagnosis. The diagnosis of Cushing syndrome is a rigorous process, often requiring confirmatory tests at each step and the endocrine consultation. A simplified diagnostic approach is shown in the figure. For initial screening, 1 mg overnight dexamethasone suppression test is a simple test to perform and suggested to be the preferred screening test. The diagnosis depends on the demonstration of, of increased cortisone production and the failure to suppress cortisol secretion normally when dexamethasone is administered. In difficult cases, like obese or depressed patients, Measurement of 24-hour urine-free cortisol can also be used as a screening test. A 24-hour urine-free cortisol is a reflection of the unbound circulating cortisol that is freely filtered by the glomerulus. Unlike serum cortisol, it is not affected by the level of circulating cortisol-binding globulins or albumin. 
Urine-free cortisone greater than three times of upper limit references is suggestive of Cushing syndrome. The midnight salivary cortisone carries a high diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. The definitive diagnosis is established by failure of plasma cortisone less than 1.8 microgram per deciliter after a standard low dose dexamethasone suppression test, which is 0.5 mg every 6 hours for 2 days. Plasma ACTH levels can be useful in distinguishing the various causes of Cushing syndrome, especially in separating ACTH dependent from ACTH independent causes. Generally, plasma ACTH levels are suppressed in cases of autonomous adrenal cortisol excess as a consequence of enhanced negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. In contrast, patients with ACTH-dependent cushions have normal or increased plasma ACTH, with very high levels being found in some patients with ectopic ACTH syndrome. In all cases of confirmed ACTH-dependent cushions, Further tests are required for the differential diagnosis of pituitary Cushing's disease and ectopic ACTH syndrome. These tests include residue ACTH suppression by high-dose dexamethasone and CRH responsiveness. Ectopic ACTH syndrome is caused by non-pituitary tumors that secrete either ACTH and or CRH and cause bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. The rationale underlying CIH test is that cortisone hypersecretion by a adrenal tumor or the ectopic production of ACTH will suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis so that inhibition of pituitary ACTH release can be demonstrated. So most patients with pituitary hypothalamus uh, dysfunction or a microadenoma have an increase in ACTH secretion in response to CRH administration, while most patients with ectopic ACTH producing tumors do not. Ectopic sources of ACTH are typically resistant to dexamethasone suppression as well. If these two tests show discordance results or if there's any other reason for doubt, the differential diagnosis can be further clarified by performing bilateral inferior pituitary sinus sampling IPSS with concurrent blood sampling for ACTH in the right and the left inferior pituitary sinus and the peripheral vein. An increase central to peripheral plasma ACTH ratio greater than 2 at the baseline and the greater than 3 after CIH injection is indicative of Cushing disease with very high sensitivity and specificity. Adrenal insufficiency is categorized according to the key site of dysfunction within the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Primary, which is adrenal, secondary, which is pituitary, and the tertiary, which is hypothalamic. A major distinction between primary adrenal insufficiency and either of the other causes is that primary disease is associated with mineral low corticoid deficiency. In the developed countries, primary adrenal insufficiency, also known as Addison disease, is most commonly due to autoimmune adrenalitis. Other causes include tuberculosis, which is the most common cause in developing countries. Other include granulomatous disorders, disorders, metastatic uh, disease, adrenal hemorrhage, human immunodeficiency virus, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and infection. ACTH deficiency causes secondary adrenal cortical insufficiency. Patients with total pituitary insufficiency may have manifestations of multiple hormone deficiencies. Patients receiving long-term steroid therapy may develop adrenal insufficiency because of prolonged pituitary hypothalamic suppression and adrenal atrophy secondary to the loss of endogenous ACTH. Plasma ACTH 
is a useful tool for distinguishing primary from secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency. In primary adrenal insufficiency, low cortisol concentrations are found along with increased ACTH levels. In secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency, both ACTH and cortisol are expected to be low. Most patients with hypocortisolism have low serum cortisol levels. However, some patients' cortisol level falls within the reference range due to the stress, which does not exclude the diagnosis. The most convenient procedure for studying patients suspected of having hypocortisolism is the ACTH stimulation test. A normal response is a cortisol level greater than 18 to 20 microgram per deciliter at 30 and 60 minutes post concentrate. The CRH test has been discussed already. To prevent the degradation of ACTH, it's best to collect a sample in a pre-chilled EDTA lavender top tube. The specimen should be kept in the ice bus and should be processed as soon as possible. Following centrifugation in the refrigerated centrifuge, the specimen should be separated, transferred to the plastic tube, and kept frozen at minus 20 degrees until time of analysis. Plasma ACTH is measured using a two-site immunoradiometric assay. ACTH consists of 39 amino acid residues, of which Residues 1 to 24 at the amino terminal has full hormone activity. Most polyclonal antibodies recognize and react with intact ACTH and terminal ACTH fragments and ACTH precursors. ACTH assays have been developed for automated immunoassay platforms using chemiluminescent labels. These methods are more precise than manual methods and analytically, they are sensitive enough to distinguish between low normal and suppressed hormone secretion. About 90% of circulating cortisone is bound to serum protein, including cortisone binding globulin and albumin. The remaining 10% of circulating cortisone is an unbound free hormone. Only free cortisone is active. Serum cortisol includes a total of free cortisol binding globulin bound and albumin bound cortisol. The measurement of cortisol includes radioamino assay and chemiluminescent techniques, as well as LCMS, which offers the ultimate in specificity. Only free cortisol is filtered by the kidneys. So, unlike serum cortisol, Urine free cortisol is not affected by conditions and medications that alter cortisol binding globulins and albumin concentrations. Urine free cortisol provides an integrated profile of total cortisol secretion over a 24 hour period. LCMS is considered the current reference method for measuring urine free cortisol. All 24-hour urine collections should include the measurement of creatinine to the assay for adequate of the collection. Up to 30% of urine-free cortisol and the dexamosal suppression screen test may come with an incorrect result. Cortisol binding globally is not present in saliva, so midnight salivary cortisol is an alternative method. LCMS is considered the current reference method for measuring salivary cortisol. Thank you for joining me on this Pro of Laboratory Medicine on ACTH and cortisol. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.